So this is a talk about the borrow checker in Rust. We're going to be going over a few different things. One, what's the use of a borrow checker? Two, how often do compilers, the things we use, the software we use to make software go sideways? Um, I still very vividly remember having a conversation with someone explaining that they caused a C++ IDE to segfault by inputting a particular string because they caused it to try to parse something and it went down this really, really squirrely rabbit hole execution path and gone. So one key takeaway I want you to have from this is this software is software and that means that it has a whole bunch of really, really squirrely behavior sometimes and it is very, very, very difficult to get right. So this is also based on a paper that some people that work on Rust put together explaining, hey, this is what we've done, this is how we did it, this is why it matters, this is what we're describing, and, well, how we pulled it off. The paper is here. I'm going to be uploading these slides later. I haven't had a chance to yet. I'm kind of cynical. I'm a jaded, bitter old man. At least I feel like one. So. I think one of the baseline motivations for people that come to this conference is therapy because they run into things that don't just not work but like comically don't work in their day jobs. Like enough to the point where even a deeply pragmatic, non-idealist, real politic kind of person says, dear God, there's got to be a better way. And that's a valuable thing because being able to step back and say, okay, hold on, is there something else going on that isn't just I come in, I punch the clock, I do what I'm told, and I go home, that is unfortunately kind of a rare skill. So let's talk about how every other language in the world sucks. So, like, baseline the billion dollar mistake. Like, let's just put nulls everywhere and it'll be just fine. That's probably a conservative estimate, especially as time has gone on. Like this, the, the, that the area under the curve is only growing. <sighs> then there's threading and sharing data between threads in a language like C++. Eric S. Raymond called this a dirty, ugly hack that you shouldn't do. <laughs> and he said this in like, when did the Art of Unix programming come out? Like 2003, 2004? And he said, almost verbatim, if you are working on a project that is tossing data back and forth, shared memory across a whole bunch of threads, running away screaming may be a completely justified response. <laughs> His opinion was the right way to do this is the Unix way, which is you have a whole bunch of tiny Unix processes. And because they're separate processes, they have separate memory addresses, so one person can't just reach in. They have to be polite to each other and do inter-process communication. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> which means that you can't foot cannon yourself nearly as easily. Which, when I saw that, it was very recently, I only just read the book, um, this was long after I got religion with functional programming. You know, I had basically written C++ off and it was fascinating to me that someone else came to the same conclusion by different means. But the problem with doing this in a language like C++ is C++ is designed to let you do whatever you want, nearly wherever you want. The way that they constrain things is they say, all right, you have public and private methods and variables inside classes and you have scopes within functions, but that, that does not carry you very far. And we're getting some really interesting things in C++ 20, but it's still not going to be to the point where you have something like Rust Spiral Checker of the locks are in the type system and they're opt in and you have to explicitly say, I'm doing unsafe things, please let me cause seg faults. It's the other way around. You have to specifically say, I know I'm doing something tricky here, 
And if I am not extremely careful and if I don't make sure that these things are all lined up in the right way, it's going to blow up. Which means that it's very, very easy to miss these things, right? The semantics of the language breed these kinds of problems. This is the, this, this is the religious, the, the, the central canon of this conference, right? The way we're doing things is not scalable, not just because, oh, we need to do better. Uncle Bob says write more tests. Thank you so much for that, sir. <laughs> when you get to the point where it's more than what one person can fit in their head, it's more than what one team can manage, it just doesn't work. And that's really depressing to think about. And so the, the, the point that ESR was making in this is that, okay, you have a thread synchronization issue. Make it happen again. Are you excited about that? Do you want to try and make it so that the right two or more instructions get executed in the right order or the wrong order? I'm not. <sighs> so you can't know a whole lot about what you're writing. It's Ruby has a bad reputation of spooky action at a distance, but at some point, a lot of other paradigms turn into that at certain scales. So let's talk about problems in, in compilers. Here are, here's a paper and a website describing how the Java type system is incoherent. If you push it in just the right way, it will just do the wrong thing. This is your type system saying, hey, you told me to do this. I'm taking this list and making it a calendar. Now the thing I want you to imagine is, okay, you are a competent Java developer. You are doing, so you're maybe using something that's new and cool and maybe you don't fully understand because that happens a lot with us developers. And this, this problem comes up. Is it in your code? Well, that's the safe assumption, right? Okay, let's keep looking through that. Google it. Well, this is a new thing. Nobody's really using it yet, probably. No, it's the compiler. So there's another, how big is, the JVM, let's just say 100,000 lines of code. That's a really conservative estimate. But let's say, there's another 100,000 lines of code that you have to search through, on top of however much you were feeding through this thing in the first place. Let's talk about C Sharp. This is something I found on Stack Overflow because everything on Stack Overflow is great. So this guy had a project, and he fed it through this particular optimizer. And it did something wrong. He found two ways around it. One is just don't use the optimizer. Turn optimizations off. You have lots in, in spare capacity, right? Server capacity, this isn't a real issue anymore. We just have infinite. Moore's Law has gotten to that point. No. The second, run the optimizer on a different machine. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about C. C has no problems. <coughs> Let's talk about something that's older, not really current and like even someone who is writing C today would look at you funny for using. Let's talk about the volatile keyword. Volatile means basically expect a race condition. It means that some other piece of code that the compiler does not know about, probably some inline assembly somewhere, might just poke this register sometimes. So don't trust the cache. Okay, that by itself should be like, right, exactly. Mortal terror, running away screaming, ESR was right, let's just go home. The compiler got this wrong. Which also begs the question, how did we find out? How long did this last? I, I, and then of course, so the YouTube talk at the bottom of this is referencing the paper in the middle. It was someone from the New York Haskell group going over CompCert, which is kind of the big daddy version of what this talk is about. It is a formal verification of a C compiler. This is a thing that people said could not be done, and they did it. Now, the funny thing is that in the same talk, he says, oh, someone asks, could we do this for C++? No. <laughs> We just did the impossible. That is more impossible. Never going to happen. But 
the way this di works, the compiler that they made, Comcert, was the only one that passed this test. So they would feed a whole bunch of different compilers different ASTs that were semantically equivalent. And the expectation is, well, if these things are semantically equivalent, they should compile down to the same things. And surprise, they didn't. Now, the good news here, and the really exciting thing about those kind souls that are writing C so that we don't have to, is doing this found a whole bunch of bugs that got fed back into things like LLVM and GCC. So ComCert costs money to use because you formally verified C compiler, holy crap. <laughs> and also, if your focus on this, if your focus is on this must be absolutely bulletproof and airtight, you probably have a little bit of money to spend on CPU power. Now, it compares favorably, I believe, within a few percentage here and there, with GCC-0, which says, just please parse this and translate it, basically transliterate it into C, into assembly, and then by binary. GCC can do a lot better than O0. So this runs dog slow. But the fact that this exists means that C and the things that depend on it are in a much better shape. I can't speak at LambdaConf without throwing shade to go. I just can't. <laughs> so here's a really fun issue that I came across. Um, so someone fed this, some piece of code into Go 1.9, and the process executed, or executed and then exited. The memory was still in use. The process was no longer in the process tree. But the only way to free that memory was to restart the machine. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> that the, God damn. <laughs> There's probably some cross interaction, right? Like you're. Still I would be very curious to know the like not so. Being a good going bug report, it is, here's the version, here are my Go and vars, here's the code I'm executing, here's what I'm expecting and what did I see. This is the bit that I snapshotted here. I want to know the rest. <laughs> but yes, this was a real report. Someone said, oh man, this is great. Thank you so much for finding this. So, it happened on at least two machines. <laughs> right, the person that reported it and the person that said, oh, Oops. <laughs> this one doesn't quite count, but again, me and Go. So Go's claim to fame, and the reason why I was super impressed with it when I first saw it is, oh, you can make parallelism super, super easy. Except, oops. <laughs> Non-traditional Go-specific problems. So this isn't... This is sort of lifting one context up, right? This isn't necessarily a problem with, oh, you coded it badly. It's, oh, this design kind of leaks. It's, you, your semantic promise was this. What you actually do is here. And there's a lot of, there's some overlap, sure. I mean, most of the time it works, but sometimes you get to the other, the, outer joins of those sets. I try to be fair here and there. <laughs> so the most famous Haskell bug is one that Simon Peyton Jones has mentioned a few times in talks he has given. So 14 years ago, someone wrote a bug report saying, hey, I found this problem. You might want to know about this. This has caused some inconveniences. So if I feed Haskell a file in this particular version of the GHC, and there's a type error in it, which we're all human. We write type errors. GHC will very helpfully print out the type error and then delete the file. <laughs> Bad! <laughs> 
Now, the astonishing thing is the, pers the people who are dealing with this were like, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I can just modify my build scripts to do a parallel checkout, move it over here, build that. If there are errors, just do it over again. It's not that big of a deal, but you know, could you consider? And then the second one, I, it's been a little while since I looked at this, but Gitline had a problem. So reading from console, nobody does that. And this is, we're not even looking at security vulnerabilities. What happens if Amazon gets hacked? Okay, you buy a copy of, I don't know, Blade Runner 2049. Great, excellent movie. Someone else buys 2,000 copies. Are you still able to make rent? I hope so. There have been multiple instances of people getting full control over anything from a commercial like home vehicle, like a car, or this is something that Pavel talked about on Monday during his TOA workshop. Someone compromised in a helicopter that Boeing made for the military. They said, oh, it's, it's fine. Listen, we're professionals. We know what we're doing. We'll give you six weeks to figure out a way in. It took them seven days. And this was full control. This was like, this is mine now. I'm sorry, the person who at the throttle, you think you know what you're, you think you're in control? No, I'm sorry, you're not. And then, this is kind of, a, this is well known enough to be a cliche, but there was a piece of firmware for CAT scan, some, some kind of radiological scan. Yes. Okay, chemotherapy, right, yes, that makes a lot more sense. So they used a bite to handle how much your dosage was. It overflowed. Radiation poisoning is really, really awful. And then, of course, there's however many rockets have gone off because converting from imperial to metric is kind of tricky, or typecasting is a pain. It, okay. And let's, let's just go for the things that you and I run into, because I suspect if we had these sorts of problems, we would not be at LambdaConf, we would be in a psych ward. But all right, lost dev time. Are software engineers well paid? No, <laughs> not, not per hour at least. Uh, do people care if your stuff works? Mm. I'm thinking black metal is the answer. Get some emperor going, we'll be fine. <laughs> Beautiful art, okay. Be brave, there is yet hope. So why do bad things happen to good processes? The fancy term for this is multiple aliases. How you would say that to a C or C++ developer is you have some number of threads that each have pointers to some memory address. That's pointing to a structure or a class or a variable or whatever. And if you don't tell them to coordinate, <clears throat> they can stomp all over each other. Now sometimes that means one thread will finish and say, okay, I'm done, I'll clean up. Well, the other ones weren't done. <laughs> or what can really, really be scary is read, write, interleaving between multiple threads. The classic example is two people are making a withdrawal of the full balance of the bank account. So one thread reads, what's your balance? One thread reads, what's your balance? Okay. Compute what the new balance is going to be. You're withdrawing everything, so that's going to be zero. Write zero, write zero. You just doubled your money. It's great. <clears throat> so let's, let's be a little bit more formal about this because this is, in theory, about formal methods. So this is multiple aliases to some resource. So that's not necessarily a pointer to a memory address. That's multiple connections to a database, right? Or multiple people wanting to write to a drive, like I.O. 
But let's just think about pointers and registers. This still leaves us in a race. This is just another way of putting the, explaining what the last slide says. We are still in the case of, if this is all we have, we have a race condition. Rust's locking membership is tracking ownership. Who has the right, who owns this resource and who can do operations on it, read or write? So what is a lock? Okay, a lock enforces that only one code location has access to a resource. In normal languages, this is opt-in, as I said. This means that you have to be the one to say, I need this here. <clears throat> Ownership is in the type system, and it's on the things that have race conditions on them, generally. So you have to opt out of it if, you, if this is not what you need. And people do this. And people have reasons to do this. Unsafe exists. Unsafe perform IO exists in Haskell. And thank goodness for that. This is a good thing. Unsafe also exists in the standard library in Rust. <clears throat> it's less. One of the conversations I had last night was talking about someone who was comparing and contrasting how quickly bug fixes got addressed in Haskell versus Rust. And he would see something in Haskell and he was like, well, I guess I had to fix that now. And he would see something in Rust and was like, oh, this is interesting. You're, you're kind of doing an end run around of the type system, but it still works. That's kind of unfortunate, but whatever. I have a job to do. And like a month later, oh, they fixed it. Who knew? Functional people could actually do things. <clears throat> so what's the first conclusion we have? Formal verification is important because eyeballing things is not enough. A bunch of other compilers have eyeballed things and they've all had catastrophic, well, mild to significant problems. Mild in the sense of these two ASTs should be equivalent and they do slightly different things. Eh, okay, fine. Or, you weren't using the memory address space, right? <laughs> Restarting a server is not a hardship, right? Okay, so, if, the bio checker is how we get out of this. It would help if that had some bulletproofness to it. So one, and this is this is this is another cognitive leap, like going from algebra to calculus or calculus to differential equations. You can look at a piece of code and say, okay, I want to test this and feed it a couple inputs and try to think about, okay, what are the edge cases for it? And then you can say, okay, well, that's fine, but I have things to do. Let's just have Quick Check look at it for me because Quick Check knows how to look into things very, very deeply and do the right thing, right? How do you verify your design? <clears throat> Someone took the workshop. So, this is not verifying that you have implemented something correctly. This is verifying that the thing you are implementing is actually airtight and does what you think. So another way to put this, what you are doing when you are saying this piece of code has no race conditions is saying that for any two operations, for any two atomic operations in your piece of software, the scheduler, whether you're doing threading or multiprocessing or whatever, whatever is saying execute this before I execute this, can do any operation in any order and you will be able to handle that. That's tricky. Because what you're, that's basically a factorial explosion. And if you have 65,000 lines of code, you're overflowing a lot of variables. <laughs> So, the type system is one of the base, really the only tools we have available, aside from just saying, okay, we have to TLA plus every piece of code that we write. That's not easy. And that is out of, the, out of reach if you are trying to bootstrap your way into being a successful startup. So that's not tenable. So let's have this thing that does some very, very good sanity checks on us and 
verify that. So step one is make sure that what the borrow checker is doing is correct, that there isn't a way to cause a race condition if we really, really scrupulously obey the type system. <clears throat> so step one, make sure it's sound. Step two, if we follow this, we still get the right answer. There is no way to do a memory leaks all over the place, even though it compiled and said it was correct. Okay. Unsafe exists. Unsafe exists in the standard library. <sighs> Crap. <sighs> but there's a reason for this, right? So if it's in the standard library, you're talking about some of the most executed Rust code out there. Because what's the first thing someone does? They pull in print. Print wine. Print wine should do the right thing. Print wine should also be fast. It'd be nice if we had both. And sometimes doing things the purely functional data structures way is not the optimal and performant way. And that gap is a big one. So I know I just spent a whole however many slides throwing shade on, oh great, nobody does it right. Well, sometimes you have to. We're engineers. Trade-offs are what we do. So, people have written correct C++. This is a thing that is possible. And at least having unsafe around it draws a big red circle saying, it would be really nice if we could do better here. So even that is still a win. <clears throat> However, Writing C++ is hard. So in the paper that I mentioned the link to earlier, some pieces of troubleshooting got their own paper. And so step one, you know that was a really good time. <laughs> step two, how did that happen? Well, you have library A. Library A does things that are marked unsafe. But you test that, you test that, you test that, you beat it to death, and then some, and it performs fine. You have library B, same situation, same scrupulousness, like we are taking this very seriously, we, are no, we know that we are going where monsters inhabit, works fine. What happens if you use them both? This is why there were papers written about it. <laughs> so, all right. I just, did, I just did explain the whole n factorial explosion, right? <laughs> and it, it's, it's even worse than that, right? Because it's not just two. It's choose three. It's choose four. It's choose, how many can you import? How much code is there? How many libraries are you sending this thing through? <sighs> anyway, this is why they, were, they had a paper written about it. So, all right. You have this really great thing. It's called formal verification. I have another thing I want to add to the list. Thank you very much. So we have, let's make sure that this borrow checker thing is even worthwhile. We have, let's make sure that when we do things properly, we get a result that behaves in a way that does not have undefined seg fault E behavior. Business logic problems are fine. We're not, we're not asking you to do that. But at least tell me that I'm using the language correctly. And we need to prove that the way we're doing unsafe in standard library is safe. So that you're never going to get to perfection, but at least you crunch down on these super mysterious, you basically have to be the library, main, not, not library, language maintainer to be able to effectively triage these problems. That's a really high bar. I'm not there. If I had run into any of these problems, I would have been hard stopped. Unless some other poor soul was the first one to run into this and posted on Stack Overflow and said, oh, by the way. OK. So like I said, this is not testing code you have written. 
This is testing a design that you have architected. This can be on a napkin, this can be on a whiteboard, this can be, hopefully, in a design spec, but it is not executable code. <clears throat> this is saying, if I design a system in this way, is there any way that someone can accidentally overdraft their account? If I design a system in this way, is there any way that they can gain access to the information they don't have? Wouldn't it be nice if some social media companies had that? And the other thing, too, here that's worth noting is that even going through the process of verification can expose hints to the implementers later on. So one of the things that happens in TLI Plus is you have the option when you're walking through a state transition graph of saying, I'm just going to camp out. I'm good right here. Now, what if you're a distributed messaging system that stops sending messages? Well, you're probably going to have a bad time. If you're on call, you're going to have a really bad time. If those messages are transfers and you are a financial company, <clears throat> lawyers are being called, either by you or on you. <laughs> so this means that you need things like a scheduler that prioritizes your process. This means that you need things like a network transport layer that retries. These are subtle things, but it's something you need to take into account. TLA has already gotten mentioned. There's COC and AGDA. On a smaller scale, we're back to testing code, but this can still prove that, for example, your type class is correct. There's Quick Check. And this is really, really good at finding really, really sneaky bugs. Ask me how I know. And there's this thing called IRIS. Now, IRIS is something that is written in COC, so it's already on the formal verification level. But it is specifically designed to handle the kind of problems that we're trying to think about here. IRIS is a higher order concurrent separation logic framework implemented and verified. Because, I mean, if you're already there, why not? Implemented and verified in the proof assistant COC. Does this sound relevant to what we're talking about? This is what they use. So the high level explanation of what they did is they took a subset of Rust, because again, modeling a whole language is tricky, and said, this is the part that I really care about. This is the part that makes the type checker go, not the type checker, the borrow checker go. So you're modeling scope, you're modeling lifetimes, which is a big prop thing that exists in Rust and is something you need to be aware of. You're modeling ownership. <clears throat> who is the person that can modify or even read from this resource? You're modeling, how do you check if ownership isn't being respected? Because one of the other things we're going to do here is we're going to look at a whole bunch of code and say, should this compile, yes or no? <sighs> what could go wrong? Okay, first off, can you read this? Look at the lights. Dim the lights? <laughs> I'm running out about two hours of sleep right now, so don't tell me. <laughs> so, these are all examples from, we start at zero in this world. This is something that runs the three examples that work from the paper. So I spoiled it here, but <clears throat> who has opinions on this? So let's, let's unpack this because the syntax is a little tricky. So. Let send receive, this is how you define variables in Rust because it's OCaml with C drag. We're getting a channel. This is how we communicate between threads. Join is saying run these things in parallel. They could be functions or in this case lambdas. 
The double bars is lambda syntax. This is the <sighs> local scope variables that we are capturing into the closure. We're not using any of that right now, so whatever. Define a vector, push a value onto it, send something through the channel, and the let dash says, I know this has a result, I don't care, because this is an example, this is not production code. I just sent this thing out, I want to push something onto it. How do you feel about that? Right. That's not right. Live coding. <coughs> Used after move. Maybe the validation worked. All right. I'm going to kill that buffer because that's an error. <sighs> All right. Let's just assume that works. Let's look at the next example. So we have a new vector. We push a number onto it. Two things read from it. Is that okay? Well, this works. Which is a valid thing to test, right? Because you don't want to reject valid programs. Hmm? Yes. So there could be something in another module modifying V somehow. Although in this, well, let's just assume that that's possible. Read one happens, something else goes on underneath. Read two happens, and it's different. Is that a problem? That depends. Right. If it's, if it's two people searching for a hotel room somewhere, and one, the per first person sees it and books it, and the second person sees it and tries to book it and says, oh, I'm sorry, you're bad luck. That's not available anymore. Is that a problem? Well, it's a problem for the person who got gypped. Right? It's, the person, it's a problem for the person who no, now no longer has a hotel. But a bigger problem will be if you flew out and went to the hotel and said, oh, I'm sorry, this has already been booked. So this is the result we want. But it, it depends on your use case, right? This is why we need to think about the design we're implementing. This is why we need to go back to TLA plus, right? All right. So let me convince you that this does, in fact, run. Compiling on a laptop is so great. OK. Now, I've already spoiled it because it's commented out. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Do I have cell still? What's the problem here? Okay, well, let me back up a little bit. Cell, what's that? That's a pointer, essentially. That is a reference to a value that you can mutate. So we do, what are we doing here in this join? Well, we have one thread that's changing its value. It was set as to zero here. One thread is setting it to one here. And the other one is saying, hey, what's your value? Which one wins? Which one should? How do you feel about this particular piece of code? And not because, well, we're trying to model something in the world, right? Well, what's your bank account balance? Or if someone else is modifying it, you might get different results. That's how I.O. works. But this is flip a coin. Now, fortunately, that's not, oh, it didn't say, did I? Live coding.
it catches this. That's subtle. I think the problem here is this is risking um, the double withdrawal problem because the semantics of the cell is, are different from the last data structure we were m messing with. This is semantically equivalent to a pointer. So you need to be the one to make sure that this is being handled correctly. Cannot be shared between threads safely. Yes, that's exactly. One of the nice things about Rust is that their compiler error messages actually make sense. So if you have concurrent things going on, they could stomp all over each other in a really, really scary way. This leads to undefined behavior. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's comment that out because I want to keep going. That's not what I meant. So now we're doing that wrapping, right? Actually, I'm curious. Okay, so let's take it for granted that this runs, right? <clears throat> this is example three. Wait for this to crunch, okay. It spits out a zero. Cool. That's not what I meant. I'm curious now. That is also not what I meant. What am I doing? You know what? I'm going to stop being clever. No, cell just can't be shared. Part of the semantics of the data type. Okay, so it has to be a factor. Is that right? That should be right. Previous one with the vector should work. I think that was in, well, hell, I'm here, why not? I don't think that will work, you have to do That's right. Oh, yes. <coughs> oh, no, that's supposed to be two. Right? See, live coding is great. Somebody else catches my problems. Oh, mud. Yeah. Am I modifying something? I hadn't noticed. No, I think you need the mutex with the vec too. Spark. 
Yeah. Mm hmm. Let's make sure I haven't broken. Is this in a good state now? Hmm. Okay. So the way they did this is, oh, this was the Go report. I should have pulled out here. So it was on Windows. That, here's a smaller reproduction. Yeah. <laughs> is an interesting result of compiler optimization. The very first call to new node never escapes, so the compiler allocates it on the stack. Its next pointer is set to point to the next allocated node, but nothing ever clears the stack allocated pointer, so the nodes appear to live to the garbage collector. I, yeah, but the process executed, dude. <laughs> now, ah, whatever. <sighs> so, I highly recommend reading this paper just for section two, if nothing else, because this is one of the cleanest and most elegant explanations of not just the how of Rust works, but the why behind it as well. This is well worth your time for this, if nothing else. However, the way they do this, um, there was, where was it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not quite up on this level of type theory, unfortunately. I tried, I really tried, but fortunately, the pros around this don't assume that you have a PhD in this. And so they're breaking down, this is why we're proving some types, this is why we're proving product types. These are the assumptions that we are making and this is why everything works. And the, exa the code examples that I just walked you through were some of the motivating forces behind that. Of I want this to compile, I don't want this version of this to compile because that's a thread safety problem. However, I still recommend you go through this. Do you have any questions for me? Because I need to wrap up. Everybody understands this. We can all do this tomorrow. What's the name of that paper? Uh, Rust Belt. It's in the slides, but um, if you Google Rust Belt proof, you will find it. Okay. So. The design of the bio checker was verified through this, and they also described finding various problems with both Rust's implementation and the type system. The process of verifying this is, we found a few bugs, we fixed those, that is what is shipping in Rust today. So, yes. Mm hmm yeah, yeah, in fact, one of, the, one of the things that I couldn't get in, yeah, this exactly. So I think this is exactly what you just mentioned, is the non-lexical lifetimes. Because v.push uh, lexical scope, it's still basically in FN example. But it's saying, in this particular case, we are doing this. And that we have to hold on to ownership for just this long, and then we can give it out to someone else. Alrighty, thank you very much.